Amen. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. Testing. Whew, I could almost, uh, almost uh, use that microphone right there. Oh. I still have my shorts on. I, was, I haven't done this, I don't know if I ever, if I ever had shorts on a Wednesday, so. <laughs> it's Florida. It's 90 some degrees. It's supposed to be 99 tomorrow. At home, I have to turn the air up, way up, just to get it to cut off. Because you can't turn it low and get it to come down. It's not going to cl- cool the house. And same for here. The gym's up, and it's just been running to beat the band. And if we let it keep running, it could wear them out, and we have to get them all repaired. That's a lot of, you know, too. So, did you get a handout? Good. Did you get one of these? Sorry. We normally have a table back there, but that's gone, so I forgot to put it down on the Welcome Center. I oh, got you. They're, they're up on top of that little music deal. In fact, if you wouldn't mind, Randy, if you could take one and just put it out on the Welcome Center, just lay in there, maybe somebody will see it there. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we normally had a little table there, and that was pretty easy. But. Uh, we're good for now. Thank you. I was just going to lay them out there so they could see them on the welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's 7 o'clock. Glad you're able to be with us here. It's, uh, and, uh, man, what a cool uh, Wednesday it is. Yeah. Hey, how's that AC working at your house? Pretty good? Still working good? He, did he, does he, is it cool at all, though? That's, that's what I was telling Beverly is that it's so hot outside, you, we have to turn ours up just to get it to go off because it's oh, just yeah, so, so hot, you know. We and should have done, we just waited until the next day when Austin came and then called. Yeah, he needs to, he needs to come back because if not, it might be weeks and we don't Austin, want that. It was Jared. Oh, Jared, okay. But I told him tomorrow I could just call and tell him, not complaining, but he took a call to say and tell us when he came back. Absolutely. Yeah, it, I would no, almost complain. The thing, though, came about. They said, you know how they send out this thing, they want you, how was our service? Yeah. And I says, you're not done yet. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so maybe that'll get them. Yeah, I think I'd type in there, you're not done yet. I think I'd type it and send it and say, I'm still waiting to have it completed. No, we don't want to hurt them. Uh, d- listen, it's not, listen, they operate off of satisfaction. And you can say it in a positive way. Yes, uh, but if you say nothing, they'll assume it's okay. You know, so yeah. silence is not good sometimes. Yes. Sometimes you just need to tell them. Hey, I'm so glad you're able to be with us. And uh, hey, did your lady take off yet? Did your lady, did she take off with the ladies? I thought she was going. But no, no, in, in July. No, in July. I was thinking she was going yeah, maybe no. this coming week. Oh, yeah. got you. Well, so glad you're able to be with us. Tonight, we've been doing over the past weeks about a um, clip of what we believe, dot, dot, dot. We've talked about quite a few different topics, and one week I was gone, and instead of throwing a wrench or something, you know, to, for Annette, I I gave her notes of everything um, about abortion. (laughs) Not that she knows anything about it, but she's in the medical field and figured she knows something about that. And so I threw in what we believe about that, and and, uh, uh, so she did a great job, and I appreciate it so much. Uh, However, I've been on track here lately of some things that we do and have, and Last week we talked about the presence of the Holy Spirit, why is he purpose, and how does it connect to us. But tonight I want to talk with you about something that's so pinnacle, it's a negative. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it's something that you can't get away from because it affects all of us, because it has the letter I in the middle of it. It's called sin, with the big I <laughs> in the middle. So tonight we want to talk about, if we can, sin, about the, uh, the personal and original sin, which really stands for the same as acts or natural sin. So we're going to look about the acts of sin and the nature of sin, if you'll look at it that way. So I have a couple verses for you tonight. I have one that's printed on here. You have exactly what I have, or I have exactly what you have. And so tonight I wanted to um, start off by giving you a little rendition of what we have in the manual of the Church of the Nazarene from the 2017 to 2021 year. We just had a general assembly, which means they've uh, confined or refined what they needed to do to 
keep it current without uh, there's no water down that I know of. There were a contingency of people, I think, believing that the church was going to water down and buckle under the pressure of some people, but it's held steady and strong and true, which is I'm really grateful for because I have a place still to serve. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of something that's mamby-pamby, watered down, believes like everybody else who's closing their doors. That's not who we are. You know, somebody, I, I told this person one time, I said, if we as a church... It was another location, another state. I said, if we as a church, because we had a neighborhood that was um, um, getting kind of rough and so on, and there were a couple other churches that started closing down and, and they were kind of moving away. And I said, you know, if, if we move out of this location, um, there's no presence of holiness of heart and life. And uh, uh, can you tell? A AJ's going to need one of these handouts here have on the Welcome Center, but I said if we move out of this location, there's not going to be any presence of holiness of heart and life in this community, and from that, um, we have a mission. We have a mission of who we are and what we're uh, called by God to do, and the very fact of our very values and character of who we are as a church, we are three primary things. If somebody asks you, Church of the Nazarene, wow, what did are you like Baptist? <laughs> you know, are you like Methodist or what? I've, uh, I had a theology professor one time who told me, he said, he says we're like splitting hairs between the Methodist and the Baptist. He said we kind of lean one way and we can lean the other way, but the reality is we feel like we kind of balance both of them, you know, because one goes two different directions. However, remember these three words, we are Christian. They, wanna, you, they say, well, who are you? What do you believe? And if you, instead of trying to be nervous or think, okay, hmm, what's the four spiritual laws? What is, uh, you know, what's my birthday? Or, you know, instead of being nervous about it, just relax and just realize we are, we are Christian. We are holiness. Amen. We are missional. We are Christian. We follow to be like Christ. This is on our website as well. Uh, we are holiness. God's called us to live a life of holiness of heart and life that it's not just what we think, but it, the outcome of our lives demonstrates what's on the inside. As um, uh, I learned a long time ago from a missionary, there is a, a missionary book that it's, dates me so much, and maybe all of you have read this. Uh, AJ may not have read it uh, because of his age. However, uh, the book was written by a missionary named Armand Dahl, D-O-L-L, -L, and the name of the book was called The Toothpaste Express. You, you remember reading that? In that, he took toothpaste and he was in the country uh, trying to get the message of the gospel out, and they were not allowing them to bring Bibles in, so he took pieces of Bible and tore it and rolled them up and stuck them in tubes of toothpaste. So when people saw the toothpaste, oh, toothpaste. Who would, in their right mind, would shove a Bible versus in that? And people would take that and wash it off gently with water, water, toothpaste, you know. And you could still read that. And they would read it as it dried. They would take that, and then they would share it with their friends and their friends and their friends and their friends until it kind of disintegrated. Then they had more that they did. So it's quite an amazing thing. I thought, you know, what links would we go to to help our friends to understand the love of God? We're Christian, we're holiness. Holiness meaning living a Christ-like life. That's all holiness is, being like Jesus. People have told me and almost argued with me, Christians, you can't live like Jesus. I said, well, I, I can, he's my example. I mean, you, you like your dad, you love your dad, right? Yeah. You can't be, you're saying you can't be like your dad? No. But maybe you can excel past who your dad is. Maybe you can be like him, but then go past that. But, but probably you'll be more like him than you realize. I said, one day you're going to get old and you'll tell those silly dad jokes <laughs> and you'll be just like your dad, okay? Anyway, Christian, <laughs> holiness, and we're missional. The mission is to go make disciples, Christ-like disciples of the nations. And in that mission... He's called us, Jesus said two things that he wants us to do. And he said in Matthew 22, he says, 
to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor. As you, and if you can't remember that, where the verse is at, that's okay, but remember the picture of the cross, loving God with all you, you are, from you to him, everything. And then loving your neighbor as yourself, the cross beam, the patibula, the cross beam. So that's where that's at. The problem is sin comes into the picture. Um, when you think about, well, let me ask you this question. When did sin first occur? Anybody? AJ, when did sin first occur? Um, when Eve was tempted. When, okay, was she tempted? What, did she sin when she was tempted? Okay, so she was tempted, okay. Did she sin? No, because you can be, you can be when tempted. She, when she ate, when she ate. Okay, yeah, whatever that fruit was, right? I've had probably nine out of ten people, Christians even, say, she ate that apple. I said, now can you show me in your Bible where it says apple? I said, it could be, but it says fruit. It says fruit. It doesn't say, doesn't qualify it. Some people believe it's a pomegranate. Um, who knows? Some people have said dates. I don't know what it is. It's something that maybe we've never seen since. I don't know. Maybe, who knows? Maybe it's an orange and the people in Gainesville uh, have an answer. I don't know. They do real well over there, the sports people as well, the university, <laughs> a bunch of smart people over there. But whatever it was, it, we don't know, but sin started not because of temptation. Sin occurred. There's a handout out there if you need one out in the foyer on the table. Sorry. The little table is gone, so we, I'll tell everyone, we try to teach them, hey, I'll put a big sign that says, take one of these. <laughs> put a dollar bill there, they'll see it every time. <laughs> so, that sin occurred not from being tempted with Eve. When did sin occur? It's a good part, good start there. When did Eve start? You said when she ate other fruit, AJ, right? Okay. Uh, would you agree with that, everybody? I think something else happened. I think I think sin started at another time, though. But what do you think? Anybody else you want to talk about it for a moment? Anybody want to talk about? It? Okay. I would talk that when the, she ate the fruit, she okay. disobeyed uh, okay. God's law and ate the fruit, so she sinned. But then she gave it to Adam, and he did also. Let me give you a thought. I don't have the passage written down for you. Nor do I have it memorized, but I can find it. I think I can guess it pretty soon. But um, there's a passage where Jesus said, if you have anger against your brother, like you wish that they were dead, so to speak, um, he says that you hate them so much in your heart, wishing that they were dead, it's as if they had you've already committed that act. Or if you have a person, a woman, and you lust against, he's talking to a man, talking to about women, he said if you have in your heart and you lust against them, it's as if you've already committed it mm -hmm. in your heart. Here's what I'm contending. Now, I agree. It, it, the act happened when the act, A-C-T, that's the key word for me to share with you why I'm doing this piece for you. The act of sin happened when she ate of the fruit. But the nature of sin happened in her heart. She had a lean, a bent, a propensity. We're going to look at that word in a moment. That she had a desire and an appetite in her heart that she wanted to eat of the fruit. Now, it wasn't because it was the fruit. Now, think about it. If you, if we just, I'm just chewing on this a little bit with you. When, when the enemy came to her, she didn't know that she, she may have been good friends with the serpent. I mean... Uh, maybe she's seen serpents before. Maybe she didn't know possibly that was uh, the devil. I don't know. We, maybe she's talked to snakes before. I mean, uh, can't you imagine she's there and there's a, a pet alligator, a crocodile. She walks up and says, hey there, Ruffy. How you doing today? <laughs> Rough, bump, bump, you know, bumpy or whatever. And, and an alligator's like, hey, I'm doing good. Hey, it's all good, you know. But for us today, if we, hey, there's a handout out in the foyer out there on the table uh, on the Welcome Center, you might want to take one of those and, and say, you know, back in the garden, everybody, there was peace. There wasn't death or anything, no sin. And they just could talk to the animals, and like um, whoever that is talks to the animals and so on. Um, then all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything, now we had, we had uh, um, critters, we had 
things to take their lives. There are areas of where they could actually lose their life or lose their hand. They can't pet the alligator anymore. The nature has, something's changed, you know. Sin has, has rippled throughout the entire part of the of existence of humanity. And it, and it happened, I contend, in the heart because she was not only hearing what the serpent was saying, the serpent said in the Garden of Eden that he says, you, she says, I can't eat of that. I can eat of any fruit uh, from any tree, the Lord said, but I can't eat of this one. And the serpent said, remember what he said? What did he say? Well, you can't eat it. You can't, and you'll know the difference between Okay, so there's more to it, though. When the, when the serpent spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said something to her. I'm just checking to see if you remember. You won't die. I'm sorry, say it again. Surely you won't die by eating the fruit. Uh-huh. Is that what he said? That was part of it, yeah. And there's more to it. The reason I say, and why I'm picking here, because I think when you get the right concept of what happened then, it may help you also in the future when someone may come and talk to you or maybe when you're, con you're confronted with it because it's more than just taking an act, a bite of the fruit. And maybe the truth is, maybe Dave's just really picky at this moment. It's been a weird day for me, okay? So bear with me for a moment and I'll get to the point and then we'll press on and we'll read some here. 7.15. In the garden, the serpent said to Eve, you can eat of this. And she says, no, I can't eat of that. The, the Lord says not to. Now see, she's obeying already, mm -hmm. right? Is that fair? And says, no, you can eat of it. It says, in fact, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You'll be thinking like God. Depends on what version you have. You'll be able to think. You'll know the difference between right and wrong. Right. And he was exactly right. He was right. He, and so what did she do? She bought into the truth of somebody else rather than listening to the heart of God. That's where the sin happened. It wasn't even the bite is that in her heart, she wound up believing someone or something else rather than listening to God. And when we choose not to listen to God, we choose to, even though we're not in outward defiance, when we choose to ignore what he says, there's sin. That's what sin is. It's, it's like, but there gets a place where she knew what God said and she heard what the, the serpent said and she chose in her heart there the act. She had the act, but the nature was already present. The nature and act is all sin. It's not two different pieces of it. It's just all one we're born with. Ever since Adam and Eve had committed sin, the nature, the sin nature has been in all humanity. It's, in, it's been in everybody. What God's wanting to do is he uses uh, impossible servants like me to try to help communicate to you about the issue that he doesn't want you to keep going through the acts of sin right. thinking it's all okay, but he wants you to stop doing the acts of sin because he wants to cleanse the nature of sin. He wants to come in, and the Bible calls that word sanctification. He calls it holiness of heart and life. It's called Christ-likeness. So he can make you not only H-O-L-Y, but to make you W-H-O-L-E. Because until we do that, we're not whole. We're still living off of our interpretations of what we believe it's saying. And maybe you're saying, well, isn't that what you're doing right now? I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. That's all. So I hope you're okay with that. And that's the basis and the foundation of what the acts and the nature is all about. And so tonight I'm hoping that we can at least touch on it. And we'll pick it up next week. See, this is the, it won't be next week. Robert's doing that night, I guess. Then it'll be the following in two, in two Wednesdays. We'll pick it up again if we need to. So let's look if we could. I want to read to you from what the, uh, the little box at the top on this page of sin, what we believe uh, in the Church of the Nazarene. And then there's a little, there's a little gray box here below. Um, in this gray box, you see paragraphs 5, 5.1, 5.2. The one in the box is 5.3. It's the last one. So I just didn't put the 5.3 on there. So here we go. Look with me. I'm going to read some of this. I'm not trying to bore you. Make sure AJ doesn't snore right there. We'll be good. We believe that actual or personal sin is a voluntary violation of a known law of God by a morally responsible person. It is therefore not to be confused with involuntary or inescapable shortcomings, infirmities, faults, mistakes, failures, or other, other deviations from a standard 
of perfect conduct, conduct that are residual effect of the fall. You see the capital F stands for the fall we just talked about from Adam and Eve. Let me finish this. And however, such innocent effects do not include attitudes or responses contrary to the spirit of Christ, which may be properly, uh, which may properly be called sins of the spirit. We believe that personal sin is primarily and essentially a violation of the law of love and that in relation to Christ, sin may be defined as unbelief. Unbelief kicked in for Eve and Adam that day when she chose to buy in and do the fruit, but she bought in what the serpent said rather than what God said. Got a conversation here? Disbelief as unbelief. How do you determine unbelief? Got a 30 seconds we can take on here? Anybody? Just jump in if you like. If you don't mind, just talk loud. If you share, it's okay. We have a microphone. Not, it's for, not for in this room, but as much as for online. I actually had a question on the sin part. Okay. Talk to me. Right. Are we talking about like things that we can consider sins that we don't that we can necessarily control? Let's say, for example, uh, you support a company um, that engages in let's say they engage in slave labor. A little louder, you don't mind. Or I'm sorry, engages in what? I'm sorry. I'm say uh, slave labor in other countries. Okay. Okay. By, by that idea of unintentional sin, okay. are you sinning because you're, because, because you're supporting Starbucks by going there because they, okay. they, they support Planned Parenthood? Because they support Planned Parenthood. Okay. Period? You at the end of that one? Okay. <laughs> Ready. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's use this example. You gave two examples there, but they both will kind of fly. Let's, say, let's use the second one you have there as well. The, if you're going there and you know that they're supporting Planned Parenthood and you're going to Starbucks, you're going there primarily, I'm guessing, to buy coffee, okay? And, and, and you feel blessed to pay lots of money for coffee at those places. And if you want more sugar in it, it might cost you a day's wages. Uh, <laughs> but it's Starbucks, but, you know, that's okay. Right, so, uh, but they're into Planned Parenthood and you stand opposed to it. If you stand with it, it won't be a big deal. But if in your heart, if in a Christian's heart, in fact, you tell me, if in a Christian's heart, um, a Christian understands that abortion, um, short of saving a mother's life, is taking a life. It's the sixth commandment, do not kill, do not murder. Um, it's a conviction. And it's something that you have to answer, I believe, before, before the Lord. Uh, the church can't impose that on anybody. I can't stop anybody from doing whatever they do. But I would believe that you come to a place that you, you won't support that. And if you're also, in the first part, the agency about slave labor in any world country or trafficking of people across Interstate 10 and stuff like that, if you know that's going on and you know there's a business out there that is, is supporting, you know, unknowingly you're, you're if you don't know what's happening you, you don't know what's happening but if you do if you it seems to me if you, we're supporting that and we knowingly know that that's um against the will of god um i think i think that's where our conscience has to understand either our conscience has been so um relaxed or we need to ask the holy spirit to awaken us again to hear his voice. What say you? Anybody else? Anybody else? If you don't mind. I'm, I'm trying to remember what you originally asked. Yeah. The unbelief. What yeah. Is well, yeah. Well, how do you hear unbelief? Yeah. And AJ, he was thinking about just sin rather than just unbelief. But yeah, unbelief, Ted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is unbelief? How do, I'm just going by the definition of what we have in the Church of Nazarene. Let, let me read that last line again. So bring it to... We believe that personal sin is primarily and essentially a violation of the law of love and that in relationship, no, and in relation to, 
you have it on your paper there, and that in relation to Christ, sin may be defined as unbelief. Sin defined as unbelief. I'm just, it's not a test. I mean, I'm not trying to give you a grade or say I'm right and you're wrong or vice versa. It's not that. This is clear cut to almost three million Nazarenes right here. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, okay, for you, it's it's a little struggle there. Help us understand what you're thinking. No, what I mean is, um, hmm. you want to wait for a bit. <laughs> it's it's the um, okay. Never mind. Never mind. I, I I probably should read it a little bit better. Okay. And. Um, this one, let me read through this one kind of quick, if you don't mind. You've got your paper there. Just read with me. And those of you at home don't have this, so um, if I can read this, I put gray on it, and it makes it hard for me to read. Let's see if I can read this. We believe, paragraph 5 says, we believe that sin came into the world through the disobedience of our first parents and death by sin. We believe that sin is in two kinds, original sin and depravity, or actual or personal sin. 5.1 we believe that original sin or depravity is that corruption of the nature of all the offspring of Adam by means of which everyone is very far gone from original righteousness or the pure state of our first parents at the time of their creation is averse to God, is without spiritual life, and is inclined to evil, and that continually. We further believe that original sin continues to exist with the new life of the regenerate, or the born again, until the heart is fully cleansed by the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Paragraph 2. We believe that original sin differs from actual sin in that it constitutes an inherited propensity, a bent, that is, to actual sin for which no one is accountable until, until it is divinely provided remedy um, is neglected or rejected. In other words, God's providing his Holy Spirit to us and when we reject the Holy Spirit of God, therefore, unbelief is pushing that off as well. So here we are, the back page, page two, we have original sin and personal sin. We've got a couple of verses that we can look at. If someone wouldn't mind reading Psalm 51, verse 5, anyone like to do that? And then if someone would read uh, Mark chapter 7, verse uh, 21 through 23. Anyone have either of those? There's uh, Psalm 51, vor- verse 5, or uh, Mark 7, verse 21 through 23. Which one would you like to read for us tonight? Which one do you have, Judy? What are you looking for? So just listen to the Psalm 51, Psalm 51 verse 5, okay. Yes. Who would like to look up Psalm, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 21, 22, 23? Beverly, you find in that one? Which one? <laughs> Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through verse 23. Okay, let's see here. All righty. Let me go back here. Mark. 7, verse 21. All right, Judy, did you find it yet? Five, verse 5. Yeah, verse 5. Yeah, read out. Yeah, if you don't mind, read out loud so they can hear you in the back too. Thank you. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Okay. All right. It's just another verse, and all these verses that you have on your handout are verses that you can take and read at your own uh, leisure as well, but it's, it's verses that will... Um, help you to see where it's supporting and the, from the verses on the other passage we just read, that paragraph. And then Mark 7, verse 21 through uh, 23, says this, For it is from within, uh, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, um, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Verse 23 says, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. Another version I have uh, says this. It's uh, another different version. It says, uh, verse 21, from, out of, uh, for, from within, out of people's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Verse 23 says, all of these evil things, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. Okay? There's two different versions that say that. Uh, any comments? You okay so far? 
Let's look a little further. Let's look down if someone would read, um, if someone would read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Anyone want to find that one? Romans 3, verse 23. And uh, I'll look up the 1st John one, unless someone else would like to read it. 1st John chapter 1, verse 9 through chapter 2, verse 4. 1st John 1, verses 9 through chapter 2, verse 4. Let me find 1st John 1. Come out, come out, wherever you are. There we go. Okay, all right. Anyone find Romans 3, 23? Beverly? What's it say, real loud? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, you want to read the next verse too? justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. He, yeah, it's a, uh, what does it say, verse 23 again? Okay, let me for the, sure. the wages? For, for all have sinned all have and sinned. fall short of the glory Very of God. Very good. Very good. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all have sinned. That means it ties into all of humanity. There's not, and actually in fact if you go, you don't have to, but here's verse 23, but if you go back in chapter 3, go back to verse 10, it says this, uh, there is none righteous, not even one. Mm -hmm. No one's righteous, okay? And uh, it's quite an amazing study just to look at this as well, but listen, if you don't mind, unless you've got conversation on this part, you okay? For the wages of sin is death, or that's a verse, that's, chapter, that's another chapter. This is 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse 9. Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Then the next verse, chapter 2 says, uh, we're going to go down to verse 4 is what I wrote down, yeah. Um, verse 1, chapter, 1 John 2, verse 1. Okay, this is the one I use all the time. My little children, or my dear children, I write you this, that you will not sin. The disciples writing this, the writer is saying, you know, I don't want you to sin. But if anyone does sin, not just you, but if anyone, anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Amen. Jesus, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Verse 3 we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. If he tells us to do it and we don't do it, <laughs> James chapter 4 verse 17 says it's sin for us. But here 1 John 2 verse 4 says, last one, whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. So it's one thing to say I'm a good person. It's another thing to do the will of God. So, I mean, are we okay with that? If God tells you to love your neighbor as yourself, we can do that, can't we? Beverly should shake her head, so if, <laughs> say yes, okay. If the Lord tells us to love our neighbor as ourself, we can do that, right? But if the Lord tells us to love our neighbor as ourself and we don't do it, and we refuse and we rebel and feel like it's ridiculous to go do that even, what do you call that? I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking. Would you call that? It, I mean, so somewhere we come to a place that our moral authority is not ourself. But it has to come in something, it seems to be. We're built to follow a leader. We're built to follow moral authority. We're built to hear, hopefully, the heart of God. And if, when God in his word says, do not commit murder, and we do that earlier with AJ's question about Planned Parenthood. If we, if we support groups that give money to help support Planned Parenthood, I mean, I'm not, I know we're not willfully committing an act of sin as such, but we are, what's the word, trafficking? Uh, let me tell you where that's coming from. Um, it used to be... Um, grocery stores. Years ago, um, Randy, I don't know if you had been a part of the church years ago when this was going on, but it used to be that 
it was said by not only the Nazarenes, but other churches were participating, uh, I understand, is that we, like in, in the Nazarenes, in the manual, we have a book called the, the manual. The manual is not above the Bible, okay? Just want to clarify that. It's, it's not even at all. But it's a guidebook to help us with our, our conduct and who we are as Christians and how to walk and help to understand. And it takes all the Bible verses and gives us directions and things to help us as, lot, as well. But it is not the Bible. But it used to be years ago, even back in 76, when I first came into the church, in 1976, I remember reading in the manual and I went to the pastor and I said, uh, <laughs> he said, do you have a question? I said, yes, I do. And I'm in his office. <laughs> I kind of do this. And I opened up the manual and I said, can you explain this to me? He said, sure, I'd be glad to try. What is it? And, he, and I showed him, I said, I've been reading this from cover to cover and I'm just trying, it's just, it's fascinating. Just, I never read anything like this book at all other than the Bible. And uh, he said, so what's your question? I said, well, here it has this thing in the back, in like the 900 section, the 900 paragraph section, way back in the back, where there are hot buttons. There are things that apparently are things the church has a stance against. He says, okay, give me one. And um, in the manual, it has, not only does it have the stuff, the information that's printed and gives you a reference spot, but at the end of the sentence, it tends to give you parenthesis type pages that tells you or either doesn't say page numbers, but it gives you a paragraph number that you can refer back to other linking passages and so on. Citation. And there you go. And the ones that struck me out, and I told the pastor, I said, it's this one about um, alcoholic beverages, going and buying, uh, going to a place that serves alcoholic beverages. I said, I, I don't understand that because even, I said, I was in, I was in the Air Force, and I said, being in the Air Force, we have a commissary, a grocery store, a commissary, and you can go in and you can buy pretty much everything much lower than anywhere else on the outside. Gasoline, same thing. Far better than Sam's, it seemed to be. At least I thought. Um, I said, but even there, they have alcoholic beverages. Are you telling me that we can't buy groceries? Is, I mean, I'm saying you're not saying it, but the manual saying we can't buy groceries because at the commissary because it sells alcoholic beverages? He says, you know, that's a great question. <laughs> I said, are you avoiding my <laughs> question by avoiding it? He said, the truth is, there's nowhere you and I can probably ever shop anywhere without buying groceries, without the influence of alcoholic beverages. And he told me, as I remembered, he said, it's kind of like going to places and establishments that sell alcohol. In other words, it was like encouraging us not to um, hang out at bars and places of that nature because of the influence of that. Uh, grocery stores, you pretty much have to, I think you got, you got to eat, you know? And, and their little mom and pop stores on the corner may not sell alcoholic beverages, but you know, they, they also crank the prices up about three to four times to make a living as well. But we did that too. Uh, did anyone ever have, have that kind of issue? Maybe not, maybe it's just me, my early days. But I was just suggesting, I know Randy, um, those days, I didn't know if you were part of the church way, you know, connected uh, back then as uh, being a manager. But, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do. And, and I go to grocery stores today. I don't even look twice at the alcoholic stuff. I know where it's at. I just walk past it, you know. I don't go looking down the thing saying, okay, which wine, which bottle, which booze, which beer, which... Which one's on sale today? You know, which one's, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not. very transient of you. <laughs> and I'm just saying, I, yeah, the problem is they should say something in the manual about bread and ice cream and, you know, <laughs> and I'd probably avoid that real well, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, well, that, that's where that's part of that is, is dealing with the issues on the internal side of who we are trying to determine what is it that God wants me to do? Because it may not be a right thing for me to do, because I believe that's where I've understood the heart of God for me, you may not have crossed that path, and we have a word for that called conviction. It may be a conviction for me, but it may not be a heart-spirit uh, conviction for you. But I would say this to you, would you allow your heart to be open to do whatever the Spirit of God would have you to do? And then when the Spirit, if you ever notice this at the end of the um, message outline section in the worship folder, I have, a, you remember what the little statement I have? I've been putting it for years. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? 
will you do it? That's all. I put that there because when it becomes your truth, when you hear what the Holy Spirit has convicted you of, then you will probably, most likely, always avoid that. Make sense? Um, and that's part of what this is about. Okay? Any thoughts yet? Questions? Okay, let's move ahead. Oh, you got a question now? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I know that, you know, the Bible, it's a, it's a book. Yeah. And there's like no magic to the physical object of the book. Yeah. But the information, of course, is God's yeah. word. Yeah. For years and years, and, and even to this day, when I have my physical Bible somewhere, yes. I avoid putting something on top of it. Like, if I put it in the back of oh. my car, I don't put the clothes <laughs> on top of it. I don't put, right. you know, the pot roast or anything on top of it. But that's, that's me. That's it's, not, it's not like, I, I, it's not part of the manual. It's not part of scripture. Yeah, I hear for you. some reason, so for me, yeah. I have a, I, it, it bothers me. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, um, so that falls into that category you're talking about of, of uh, yeah. you know, maybe that conviction. talking to you about a certain thing. Yeah, that conviction. When I'm at home, we have this big, giant family Bible that's on this uh, chest of drawers. If you walked in up the steps through the bedroom and near the bed, there's dressers and closet and two closets. And, and there's this uh, chest of drawers that Nita uses. And, um, and on top of it, right in the center of it, is this big black family Bible that her mom and dad gave to us when we were married. Uh, we keep it there. And, uh, and she has little things here, and I got little things on this side of it. And, and all of a sudden, she's in a hurry many days, and she's going to work and not thinking she's moving something to get something. And, and you got to find space to put it up somewhere. And so she takes something, and she likes maybe has a necklace or something. She just plops it on the Bible there. And then she gets busy, and she takes what she's going to do, and she takes off. Well, when she leaves, I see it's there, and what do I do? I pick it up and move it back over here. Yeah. <laughs> And then many days, I will, I just, I just, I dust it. I, I know it's kind of, I know I'm with you. I just think that it's, and maybe to some people, it's a, it's an illness that I have, but I just, I, I love God's word and I don't hide, I try to hide it in my heart all that I can, but I could always do more. I know that's very subjective and maybe none of us read enough, don't pray enough, I understand. But to me, I don't want to put my soft drinks on top of it. You know, it's a respect. It's an honor. And, and it should be because uh, this very aspect of the Word of God, and doesn't matter what version it con, uh, constitutes, the very fact that it's something that brings life to whoever will do what it says. Uh, I'm with you. That's, to me, that's a conviction that I have. And I don't judge Nita. And I don't fling her stuff in another part of the house or I don't have some kind of carnal attitude or something. I just move it. And, um, and then one day I moved something. And she moved it back, and I happened to come into the room, and I noticed it was there, so I picked it up and moved it back off there again. And then one day I asked her, I said, did, did you still need this? And she says, where is it? She says, I laid it there. I said, well, it was laying on the Bible, and I moved it right over here. She says, oh, I was wondering how it got over there. I said, is there a reason why you just laid it on the Bible? She says, I'm not even thinking about the Bible. I'm just right. moving, I'm just putting it down somewhere. Which tells me if, in one sense, for me, if I put it there on purpose, there's an intention of the heart. Sin, we believe, is a willful intention. We choose to walk that direction. But if you take something and accidentally do that, we're going to look at the word mistakes in a moment, or an accident, or involuntary. You didn't do it on purpose, you know, but it just happened to be there. And that also, believe it or not, in the Bible, the words that are built for all those words for um, involuntary or accident or mistakes, those words also constitute a word of sin. But we don't see them as actual or personal sin. We see it as something that's involuntary, but it could lead to something. It's like you driving down the highway thinking you're doing 55 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden there's someone doing 100, and they can't get around, and all of a sudden hits you and veers off the road and crashes and possibly dies. And the policeman pulls me over and says, you were going too slow on the interstate, and I'm holding you for involuntary manslaughter. I'm going, the sign says 55. I was doing 55. Although if he ever pulls me over, I better be doing 55 because many times I'm not. <laughs> but I'm doing it because I see him coming as well. But I'm doing that in order to be a solid fixture as such. 
But if that person dies over that, I don't know how they could do that. But I did not intentionally try, try to cause the accident. That's what I'm saying. When you intentionally do something, there's a motive in the heart. Okay. Hope this is helping. Let's look at, let's look at the next one. Here I have a place you can fill in. Uh, you have the original sin, the nature, personal sin, uh, the uh, acts of. Okay. And you can take those. I, I encourage you to take them home and read them. Uh, number one, sin versus mistake, 743. We're going to get through this. Sin versus mistake. Sin defined by John Wesley is sin is a blank, blank against a blank, blank of God. Anyone know what those are? Yeah, Rick. Willful transgression. Say it again. Willful. Sin is a willful transgression against a blank, blank of God. Known. Known. Law of God. Known. Sin is a willful transgression against a known law of God. That's a, that's a mouthful from back in the 1700s, but we still believe it's solid today. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Is that what you're going to say, Rick? Yep. Yeah, very good. Hey, James chapter, seven, verse four, James chapter 4, verse 17 says what I said earlier, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. That's the act of sin, knowing you shouldn't do that. But Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, if you'd like to turn to that, I hope that you would. I hope someone would read that because I want I to um, tell you what it says, but I, I, I think I'd rather have you, uh, one of you to read it because I know exactly what it says, and um, um, it's what it does. It's what causes when we do this sin. Do you have it, Bev? Yes. Read it out real loud so they can hear you in the back, if you don't mind. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Amen. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you so that he will not hear. Okay, that's good. All right, very good. So, here, your sins have separated you from your God. What is a, um, what's something that you really like? Um, AJ, do you, do you like desserts? Uh, actually, not as much as I used to. How, what, what do you like? What do you like? What, what is it, uh, some kind of food that you really like? Yeah, what do you have an appetite for? It's you would just, man, you had the choice of that and a piece of candy. You would say that every time. I guess ice cream and a piece of candy. I don't know. It's a weird combination, but I would go for it. So what would you, what, what could that be? I'm just trying to find what that might be. Do you have an idea? Uh, Anybody? Anybody have an idea? What's something that you really, i say it again. I said ice cream. Ice cream. What flavor? Um, uh, uh, ice cream. Uh, <laughs> mint chocolate chip. There you go. Um, uh, actually, dream sickle. Oh, describe dream sickle. What is it that? It is like orange and vanilla. Together. Yep. Mm, it's or, very good. Although, uh, you could also switch up the orange for lemon. Hey, let me tell you how old I am, AJ. When I was a kid, I used to have a paper route, and I'd, make, I'd earn money, and I'd go by this one <laughs> store when I carried my paper route, and I'd go through, and I would stop in this little store, and I could get um, a fudge bar for like 10 cents and an and <laughs> ice cream bar with chocolate coating for 12 but, but for another t for 10 cents, um, I could also get this little thing called a push-up. It's a little round cardboard tube with a stick in the middle. Th now they got plastic, but I had a stick then. You push it through on a round platform, and it shoved it out, and, and it was a dream sickle is what that was. I, Man. I, I, I remember that. I, I, I used to go to these, to these uh, camps when I was younger. Okay. Um, and these camps they had those? Uh, well, they were for blind well, and visually impaired people specifically. Yep. They all have those, yeah. They, they always had, they were always selling stuff for us. Well, it, when I couldn't get ice cream, I always all see the bus or the bush. Well, the, the thing is, is getting to the place of the appetite, yeah. and sin goes after the appetite, my definition. You can't, you don't have to quote me on that, but I'm saying I have chewed on this, so to speak. I <laughs> think about food, I shouldn't bring that up. I've already had supper. But anyway, um, but the appetite is that it hungers. It's the same thing as, a, as lusting, what Jesus had talked about. You have this appetite in your heart for something. And as much as, I'm not saying ice cream is sinful. I'm saying the same thing that drives you, I've got to have it. I've got to have this. I've got to have my morning coffee. I've got to, oh, meddling now, man, coffee oh, thing. It's something you but, You've got to have, and that's the appetite, and that's where the sin's coming in. 
When, you, when, when a guy and a girl first start dating and, and one thing leads to the other, before you know it, before you see the next event, we don't need to see that part, but the part that leads the two of them up, the guy is the nicest guy on the planet and the lady is the n nicest person on the planet and they're attracted to each other and the pheromones are going crazy and all these emotions and things inside are going crazy and both of them have one appetite inside of them. The guy is thinking about how to take this woman back to his place, and she's thinking, how much money does he have in the bank? No, I'm just teasing. That's not true. She, I don't know what they're cool. thinking. But, but I'm saying it's, it's in the appetite. Okay, and that's something we've got to be watchful for as well. And uh, let, me, let me press on because we're running out of time here. It's 7.50. If you look at this word mistake... As a noun, it says an action or a judgment that is misguided or wrong. For example, coming here was a mistake. Maybe you thought coming to church tonight was a mistake. That would be a mistake, okay? But hopefully not. I had a friend of mine used to say, uh, I'd say, hey, I'll come by and pick you up tomorrow morning at 8.30 to go wherever we were going. And he would say, if the Lord wills it. And I said, well, <laughs> okay, I understand. I, I hear what you're saying. But I'm guessing the Lord is going to be okay with me bringing you to his house. You know. Anyway. Um, sometimes it's, it's as a noun. Sometimes it's a synonym. synonym uh, not cinnamon. Synonym. Like as an error, fault, inaccuracy, omission, slip, blunder, miscalculation, misunderstanding, oversight, misinterpretation, and so on and so on. Faux pas, uh, so on. More slips to the tongue. Uh, um, I got this out of the dictionary. I don't know what egg corn is, but, you know, E-G-G-C-O-R-N. I assumed it had been a mistake, or he admits he made a mistake. You don't hear that very often. But as a verb, it means to be wrong about. Because I was inexperienced, the example is, because I was inexperienced, I mistook the nature of our relationship. Last page. Dr. H. Orton Wiley, uh, I never had him, but I had to read his three volumes of Christian theology, one, two, and three, and in that, he had one statement that I've been overwhelmed with for, through the years. And so I have it here. It's a link. Uh, now, you can't click on the link here, but people online, um, well, I could send it to you if you wanted this information. It basically um, says, calling that sin, which is not sin, opens the door also to actual sinning. I don't know if you understand that. It took me a lot of years in seminary to chew on that. Call, that's right. Calling that sin, which is not sin, opens the door also to actual sinning. Let's say eating uh, dream sickle ice cream is, <laughs> you call it sinful when it isn't. But it starts opening doors for other things that you start going through. And oh, hold your hand there. We've got one more for you. Dr. William Perkheiser, Orton Wiley was our theologian through the Church of the Nazarene. William Perkheiser uh, was a, uh, over the Herald uh, of Holiness many, many years as such. And, and it's funny, I have a picture here of Wiley, but I never could find anywhere, anywhere a picture of Perkheiser, which tells me he believed of not getting any attention. He didn't want any attention. But to make everything sin is, in effect, to make nothing sin. It is impossible to grade sins, he said. Let me say it again. But to make, Perkheiser said, but to make everything sin is, in effect, to make nothing sin. It is impossible to grade sins. Looking at the, either of those two, got a conversation here, either of you, on these two, this passage right here? These two things, anybody? Do you understand what it's saying is that if, if we're making everything sin, then nothing is sin. Give us an example. But, but if you make it an idol, then it becomes a sin. Well, like, uh, yeah. When you're talking about, like, th th there's an example you used about, I have to have my cup of coffee. Oh, that's a bad, that was a bad one. I, I didn't mean to say that. But my, my, well, my point, my point <laughs> being, I mean, it, this can go for anything. If, if, if you're having a headache, do you yeah. go for the medicine cabinet first, or do you say, God, please help me? No. Or please do what you, please do what you can. Yeah. That's good. Me That's good. Yeah. Before yeah. you 
you decide to go to the medicine cabinet. That's good. You easily say, God, God um, yeah. I, 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 I am going to take these head, take, I'm going to take headache pills to get rid of my headache. Mm -hmm. If you, if, if you will, if you will for my headache to go away, then I pray, that okay. I pray that it will. And if it is your will to use okay. this, this aspect of your creation as an avenue to make it go away, uh -huh. then I hope that is the case. Okay. Hold that thought. Anybody else? Anything else you want to share on this? Yeah, Rick. Mm -hmm. it, this is similar to um, when you're trying to prioritize things and you say everything's a priority. If everything's a priority, then nothing's a That's priority. That's exactly right. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it may be. Yeah. Life, all of life is lemons. You know, make lemonade. Well, then everything's lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> and it's overqualifying it. And God gave us this incredible species of all kinds of different things. That's why flowers are so different. But uh, it is very true, um, this, this very thing as well. Uh, about the headache, I've had one literally pounding all day. It's pounding right now still. It's just been there all day. I haven't taken anything for it. Uh, of course, I had someone ask me, did you drink some coffee yet? I went, oh, yeah, but it didn't help. Did you have something to eat? I said, yeah, but it didn't help. But no one was telling me to eat or drink for that. I just, I, you know. Water, you had water? Yeah, I've had water. I drink lots of water through the day. I'm short today. I'm only about 60 ounces, so I'm, I'm short about 20 or 30 ounces so far. You come on in. And, and then, so, I still have a pounding headache, so I'm believing this, AJ. The Lord can do what he wants, but uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in rhythm. I don't have high blood pressure. I, uh, this, I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm not pregnant. That's a good thing. So whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, it, it'll go away tonight because probably I just need to sleep tonight and sleep better. Maybe I just didn't sleep well last night. That could be part of it. Sometimes it happens, you know. Now, Beverly should have a headache. She works with me at the office, and so <laughs> she probably has a headache a lot. <laughs> let, me, let me wrap this up. It's 7.55. Um, I want to tell you number four and number five, but if you'll take this and read this, okay, I, I know you'll see it. I want to close off with 1 John 3, verse 6 through 9. And this is really pinnacle for understanding about sin and us knowing God. Because God wants us to have a relationship with his son. Let me, let me close this off at 755 here. Verse 6 says, um, at the bottom of page 3, No one who lives in him, him meaning Christ, keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Here's what I'm trying to say at this last part. Yes, the seed of God, the word of God is hidden in you. The point is, there, we're all apt to sin. I'm not saying we have to sin. I think the Spirit of God makes it able that we don't have to sin. But 1 John 2, 1, we just read said, But if you do sin... You have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. Just confess it. Let go of it. Quit carrying the burden. Let go. But the other side is also good. Stay loyal to him. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. So walk with him. Walk with him. And 1 John 1, 9, we just read that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just Amen. to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you've got to confess it. You've got to let go of it. Wesley again said, sin is a voluntary transgression of a known law of God. That is basically saying sin is a matter of choice or intention or of purpose. I hope that has helped a little bit tonight. We'll follow up uh, next week. Uh, Robert's uh, got a big lesson planned out, uh, interaction type thing and missions, uh, the Church of the Nazarene, whatever it may be. And then... Two weeks from now, I'll come back with another belief. And if you have, ever have any kind of inclinations or things you'd like to talk about, don't write, write me. Let me know, okay? Let me pray with you before we go, okay? Um, I, wanna just, I just want to speak these words out. In fact, I'll just sing them. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. 
Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me on me father bless everyone in your divine presence tonight and oh lord as we leave this house tonight may we understand that god is for us and because you are for us you're not against us and help us to be reminded of three words jesus is lord amen god bless you you're dismissed thanks for being here tonight amen good night see you sunday it's gonna be a great day got a special Speaker here Sunday, uh, Reverend Mark Bain, uh, my goodness, you don't want to miss it. Man, if you ever wanted to hear somebody who's come from the rags to riches street to the kingdom, whew, you need to be here.